uh, for Brother Young to preach. I'm going to preach to you now. And uh, you have a good lunch? Good dodgeball? Good. I appreciate you coming today and excited for what God has for us. Sure appreciated Brother Young's message earlier today. It was, it was great and uh, touched my heart. I hope it touched your heart. I do have to correct just a couple of things that he said. All right, now, my name is J.D. Howell. I'm the pastor here, so it's my church. I've got to make sure it's right. He, he made a statement about, um, Brother Young, you didn't hear yet, Brother Young? He made a statement about the cold weather being a curse. Did you catch that earlier? He tried to use... Try to use the Bible in defense of that in the garden. I would direct his, my friend, and Brother Young's a tremendous man, but I had to direct his, his attention to another passage where Jesus talked about heaven and somewhere else. That other place was hot. I wouldn't want to use the Bible, I'm just saying that. Uh, you see, he lives in Florida, came to Michigan. I was born in Florida, Pensacola, Florida, was I was born, and have now moved to Michigan. And, uh, you know, I hate to call him out on that, but I just, you know, I was reading my Bible, and boy, I tell you what. Um, and then he had the nerve to talk about throwing up on roller coasters. Okay? So I remember the first time that I went to Cedar Point, I was in the, the 10th grade. And uh, the second roller coaster I rode is no longer there. It was called the Mean Streak. Anyone remember the Mean Streak? All right, that was the second roller coaster I rode. Amazing fact about that roller coaster I learned that day, I learned that I threw up on roller coasters, as did the girl in front of me. It was a neat thing that we both figured that out after that ride. It was a special day for us. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. But then we knew each other, and uh, that was a neat thing. And, uh, and then, you know, believe it or not, it just like the message was just touching my heart this morning, as you can tell. I, mean, I was listening to it. He talked about that. He asked the question if you've ever had uh, the police come and say, Come out with your hands up. I, now you want to know what happened. I'll tell you what happened. I was out, I was out soul winning, bus calling, inviting folks to church. And I was, it was years ago, I was a youth pastor, a little bit after that, I was in my, my little red car. It was in downtown Saginaw, driving along the street there. And, uh, all of a sudden, Pastor Scott Cowling was with me. He will verify this story, okay? He's in the pastor seat next to me. I'm driving down this road, and all of a sudden, two police cars come up behind me, and they jump the curb at an angle, block me from behind. Both officers, or the officers, jump out with their guns drawn and say, get out of the car with your hands up. Almost simultaneously, two cars, police cars come in front of my vehicle, pop that curb here and here. They both jump out, so I've got four cars worth of police officers with their guns drawn saying, get out of the vehicle with your hands up. You know what I did? I wet my pants. No, I not No, 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 thanks. And if I had, I would not tell you about that. I'll tell you that right now. I got out. Well, you say, well, what was going on? Well, what happened, apparently, oh, like just a few minutes before that, they had a report that someone in a vehicle just like mine was driving around the neighborhood where I was at, waving a gun out of the window at houses. They saw me, thought it was me, I guess, the vehicle, didn't take any chances, and then, you know, then we quickly settled up, so I didn't spend any time in jail, thankfully, but all three, I could check the box on all those three, so I appreciate Brother Young's uh, message this morning, just touched my heart. If you have your Bibles, though, would you open to 2 Chronicles chapter 34? 2 Chronicles chapter number 34. There are people who are good at sports and people who are not so good at sports. You with me? I don't mind if you're good or not so good, but maybe my favorite group of people are the ones who think they're good at sports, claim they're good and not so good. Have you met these people? Hey, Pastor, I'll smoke you in basketball. I'll tear you up. You get in the court with them? <sighs> okay. All right, all right. You can't run with like a football man. You got to dribble it. What, what's that? There are good soccer players and... Bad soccer players. How many, how many play soccer or like soccer out there? Who likes, who hates soccer? You're right behind a good friend of mine by the name of Pastor Anthony Fusco. All right? He will tear you up for me. Not because he knows you or not because like you. He's from Missouri today. My good friend Pastor Fusco came from Missouri today uh, with his, with his, yeah, yeah, hey man, he was good. He was glad he was here. Um, but he's that guy. He's that guy. He works security for, for against shoplifters. Didn't you, Pastor Fusco? 
Whoever pays the most, that is Pastor Fusco. So you watch it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He will tear you up. Um, anyway, I, I, I like soccer. I played some soccer. But I got to one time to play and practice with a man who had played for the World Cup team for Bolivia. I've seen some good soccer players. This guy was phenomenal. Better than the young ladies, all right? He, he was really good. I've had some good cooks and some bad cooks in my life, and, and every once in a while, I get a little bored, and I go onto YouTube, and I see a thing called Internet Fails. <laughs> Seen these before? They start about the same normally. There's some nice lady, she's riding down the, down the street in the bicycle, and your stomach starts to flip already because you know something horrible is going to happen, right? Next thing you know, a truck backs out, hits her, she falls, hits her face, slides on the pavement. And what do you do? Strangely, you continue to watch. You see the young man next, and he's on a skateboard, right? You're like, oh, this is going to be good. Another guy doing parkour is going to leap a huge gap between two buildings. But because it's internet fail, you know he's not going to make it, right? Now you're just wondering, how is he going to fail? This will be tremendous. Is he going to fall in the gap? And sure enough, he jumps and boom, hits the wall. Your stomach kind of lurches, but you're like, I can't look away. <laughs> you know, the fact is, there are some people who do well in life and some people who would be better left off sitting in a lazy boy all day long. But just because someone claims to be good at basketball or riding a bicycle does not mean they actually are. And just because someone claims to be a Christian does not mean they actually please the Lord. You could, you could claim to be a Christian and hopefully you've put your trust in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that you're living a life that pleases Him. It'd be terrible if we had a Christian fail video, wouldn't it? We'd see, unfortunately, sometimes life after life with choices that don't please the Lord, hitting the brick wall of God, His commands, His directions. This afternoon, I want to briefly, just for a few moments, we have just a little bit of time here, direct your attention to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. If you would, look at verse number 27. Kind of our text for this, this morning, we'll go back in the chapter. Verse 27, where God says, Because... Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. I want to speak this morning, this afternoon, briefly on that, that word in verse 27, when thine heart was tender. Say that with me, when thy heart was, say it with me, tender. You know, I, I understand what a tender piece of steak looks like and tastes like. I like steak. Anyone else here like steak with me? I like steak. A few years back, or a lot of years ago now, I'm old now, and uh, I did an activity when I was youth pastor called BYOM, Bring Your Own Meat. So that day we went to a park, took a grill over there, and some, the, all the teenagers and adults who helped me brought their own meat, and, and some people brought steak. Some people brought hamburgers, for hamb and, and one kid brought hot dogs. Um, but there was this one young man. He was in the, I think, ninth grade, somewhere in there. And that day, he, he, he brought us this piece of flat steak to cook. Now, how it worked is I'd have the grill, and another man and myself would, uh, would cook the meat until you said it was done. All right? I didn't care how long. If you want a piece of chicken cooked three seconds, I don't give a rip. All right? We can take you to the hospital. They help sick people every day in my life. All right? So that's fine. So we're cooking these things. And, you know, the steak's down there for the first kids, and the hot dogs, and the hamburgers. And this particular young man wanted his steak cooked for a long time. I got to the point where I thought it was like medium rare. That's how I like my steak. He's like, no, 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 leave it on there longer. Left it on a little bit longer. Hey, well, how about now? No, not yet. How about now? Not yet. How about now? Not yet. Until finally, this piece of steak was like this. Like a piece of wood. Piece of leather. The thing was like solid like a rock. He's sitting there, mmm, this is good. <laughs> Dude, you're weird. I know what a tender steak looks like. 
I know what a tender place on my arm or leg from a bruise feels like. Don't you? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hey, 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 easy. What happened? Oh, I got a bruise. Don't touch that. You back off. All right, I'm, I'm healing right now. I'm self-healing. I don't need you hurting my, my healing process. But what does a tender heart look like? You know, we'll challenge young people, we'll challenge adults, we'll challenge Christians to have a tender heart for God. Does that mean you're not on the grill for a long time? No. This passage, I believe, gives us the, the characteristics of a tender heart. It's talking about a young man by the name of Josiah. And if you would look in verse number 1 of chapter 34, we're going to look at the life of, life of Josiah very briefly, and then I'll give you the characteristics of a tender heart. In verse 1, the Bible says Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem 1 and 30 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, help us just these next brief few minutes. Lord, help our hearts to be turned towards you. Lord, there's a lot of distractions. There will be distractions in here. Lord, there's probably distractions in their hearts and minds of some of these young people. Lord, I don't know what each person happens to be going through today, but I know that you do and you have a mind to heal them and help them. Lord, help me as I speak to say those things that will be profitable and helpful. Lord, may our hearts be tender to you right now and respond in tenderness. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. A tender heart. I, I see a couple things about Josiah. Before verse 27 happens, I see a few, a few um, ideas about Josiah. I see the Bible tells me that he began to reign when he was eight years old. And the Bible says while he was yet young, he began to seek the Lord or did what was right in the sight of the Lord. The Bible tells us he was in the eighth year of his reign. He was around 16 years old. You see, I'm glad the Bible tells me that Josiah was 8 when he began to reign and 16 when he really turned toward God. Because that tells me that there are no excuses for following God. There are no excuses for following God. You can't say, well, Pastor Howell, I'm too young to follow God. The Bible teaches us that it's not an age, the determination to follow God. You can follow God today. And Josiah was commended for following God while he was young. You see, we want to make excuses. What can I do? I'm only 8. You can follow God. I'm only 12. You can follow God. I'm only 16. You can follow God. There are no excuses. If you were to read the passage further, you would find out that Josiah's father's name was Ammon. He was a wicked, wicked king. I'm glad the Bible lets us know this about Josiah as well. Because Josiah didn't come from a good home. He didn't come from the perfect family. He didn't grow up like some of you had the privilege of growing up with a mom and dad who both love God and serve God and bring you to church all the time and have you come to youth conferences. He grew up like some of the rest of you. Who maybe one parent has a heart toward God and one doesn't. Or maybe neither do. Maybe some of you don't know or haven't much of a relationship with a mom or a dad. Josiah didn't come from the perfect family. And, and sometimes young people will say, well, if I had that opportunity, then I could serve God. If I had those parents, then, then I could follow God. If, 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 they were, if they were helping me, I could. Josiah didn't have that. His dad was a wicked king. But he didn't make any excuses. You know, we all have excuses. I asked my kids, I have three kids, Johnny is 11, James is 9, and Danielle is 7. All right, which one do I love the most? All of them. They're all different. My wife accuses me of, of loving Danielle more than her sometimes. It's not true. I love my wife. She's my wife. Does Danielle ever get anything she wants? Absolutely. No doubt. She's my baby girl. In fact, this last year, I'll give you one confession about this. I am big on not listening to Christmas music before Thanksgiving. Good. That's where I'm at in life. But in October, I had a, a little problem. In October, we're in the car. My wife's next to me, and the kids are in the back seat and in the back of the vehicle. And my, my daughter says, hey, Daddy. I said, yeah, baby girl. She goes, Daddy, can we make a rule? In the back seat. I said, oh, what's that, baby girl? I'm just driving along, minding my own business. She goes, Daddy, can the rule be the second time it snows, can we listen to Christmas music? My wife's next to me in the passenger seat, and she's like thinking to herself, she tells me, 
Oh no, oh no, Danielle, you're about to get your little heart broken. Daddy's going to say no the first time. He's just going to drop you. It's going to be hard. You're going to be crying when he says no. And, and to her surprise, I'm like, sure, baby girl, it's fine. My wife says, she goes, I tell you what, he's never said yes to me. Oh, I love my kids. But they like to make excuses. All of them. Hey, Johnny, why didn't you take out the trash? Oh, you've had this, haven't you? Oh, well, Dad, you see... You understand something. Uh, I didn't know you wanted the trash taken out. I thought you wanted the trash taken out. That's how ridiculous you sound as well. I didn't know you wanted all the trash taken out. I just, just, just the trash that I could easily get to. No, take the trash out. How about this one? Sorry, Mom. Sorry, Dad. I forgot. Come on now. You ever forget? No, no, no. Now, forgetting does not solve the problem. Oh, I didn't know you forgot. I'm sorry, Johnny. No big deal. In fact, Johnny, go have a seat. Let me get you something to drink. Because you forgot and have an obvious trouble with your memory, I'll take the trash out for you. Is that, is that what parents say? Yeah, I said no parent ever. Johnny, I don't care if you forgot. I don't care about anything except the trash getting out of the curb right now. Josiah didn't make any excuses. He didn't say I'm too young. I don't have a good background, a good heritage. He just humbled himself before God. He had no exceptions in his life. And verse number three, if you were to, to follow on in that, in that account, in verse number three, you'd find out that, that Josiah went to the kingdom and began to tear down images and groves or places of idol worship. Now, a few years back, I went to Cambodia. And in Cambodia, they still worship real life idols. They don't do it so much in the United States, but other countries, they still will. I'm talking about like a, like a piece of stone that's carved. I could actually have touched the idol. And people will come and, and burn incense and think that this piece of rock is a god. All right, And Josiah was tearing those down. Little known fact, people do not like their idols torn down. Who knew? If you doubt me on this, now don't do this. If you doubt me and you happen to be in Cambodia and there's an idol there, do not go kick it over. People will not be happy. They don't like their idols torn down. Right? They worshiped them. Josiah made no exceptions. He lived in a place of idol worship, and he started tearing through the country, tearing down the idols in order to please God. And I guarantee people were not happy. You know that as you follow God, there are going to be times that people are not happy with what you're doing. If you take a stand for God, for his truth, his righteousness, there's going to be times that people will not be happy. He wanted to know about God. He wanted to learn about God. And he got rid of what God wanted rid of. Well, that's a good thought right there, isn't it? Maybe something in your life and heart that God wants you to get rid of. You know what Josiah did? He got rid of what God wanted rid of. I see no excuses, no exceptions, and no empty commitments. He made a commitment to follow God. It was a big choice, but he made the right choice. We're in an age and time of empty commitments. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. If we're not careful, we will have emptiness in what we say. We claim to want to follow God, but it's, it's empty. And Josiah didn't have empty commitments. Then we come all the way to verse 27 this morning, this afternoon. And see in verse 27, uh, a commending of Josiah, his tender heart. I want to give us tonight, today three characteristics of a tender heart, of what a tender heart looks like. Because when a heart is tender, God blesses it. When a heart is tender, all right, God brings mercy. When a heart is tender, God commends, and he has others follow the example of it. I want us to have a tender heart for God. I want you, whether you're 15 or 18 or 48 or 68, to have a heart that's tender toward God. See, tender heart's not just about tears. There's three characteristics in this passage, if you look with me there in verse 27. The first thing that I see is a heart that is tender is a heart that hears. Is a heart that hears. If you're taking notes, a heart that hears. Or a heart that listens. Have you learned to listen to God speaking to you? 
You know, he'll speak to you sometimes through his word. When you read your Bible in the morning or afternoon or at night, I hope you read it every single day, God will speak to you through this book. He'll talk to you about the right attitude to have. He'll, he'll tell you things like, a soft answer turneth away wrath. That means there are times to not answer like you want to. The Bible speaks to us that way. It'll talk to us about how we ought to not uh, be quick to speak, but be slow to speak, quick to listen. Or say it this way, in 2020, sometimes you need to shut up. The Bible speaks to us that way. You see, God will speak to us through his word. He'll speak to us through his Holy Spirit. He'll speak to us through godly influences. That may be a godly mom or dad or a pastor or a youth pastor or a special speaker or a godly friend who comes and says, listen, what are you doing? God will speak to us through those godly influences. But a tender heart, the first characteristic, is a heart that listens. When I fly on an airplane, I have noise-canceling headphones. A couple reasons that I have these noise-canceling headphones. The first reason is I have no desire in my life now to listen to the safety instructions on the airplane. How many have ever flown before? Anybody, yeah, you've flown all right? You're right there, you know, here's how you buckle a seatbelt, like I've never done that in my life before. And then they tell you this amazing thing. Your seat will double as a flotation device. Now, this is a problem because I'm flying to California across dry land. So if I'm in the water, we got an issue in life. But, but help me here. How can dropping from 30,000 feet to zero feet... I'll be saved by a seat that now doubles as a flotation device. All right, hey, just in case we go in the ocean, which we're not really going over, and if we go in the ocean, we've now dropped 30,000 feet, you'll be okay because just grab your seat. No, I'm not going to be okay. Stay in the air, thank you. I have no desire to listen to safety instructions, so I put these noise-canceling headphones on. They drowned out the droning of the safety, the safety demonstration. And they drone out the annoying voice of the child right behind me. Right? Ah, gone. I'm now in a wonderful bliss of silence to myself. Because you know what we do sometimes, young person? And adults, we do this. God's trying to speak to us. And we've got God-canceling headphones on. He's trying to speak, but we're not hearing you see that passage that says, you know, Josiah, you have a tender heart because thou hearest the words. You have a heart that hears, an ear to hear. Your heart's tender because your ears have learned to listen. If you want to have a tender heart, have your ears learn to listen to how God speaks. Sometimes they'll speak in a still small voice. We'll call it words like conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like a, a, sometimes a feeling, sometimes it's, it's just a, a knowledge that, you know, what you're doing is not right. That's the voice of God. Sometimes we view God's voice to be annoying, and we block it out. I think the most annoying sound known to man is the sound of a mosquito in a tent after dark. We go up on a wilderness camp, a camp with the boys and some men from our church. You lay there in that cot. It's all dark out, no sound except some crickets. And then you hear that incredibly annoying sound. Bzzz, and it stops. And what do you do? You slap everywhere you can. You're like, yeah, I got it. Bzzz, oh, man, slap again. Sometimes, Christian, that's how we treat the voice of God in our life. Stop, I don't want to hear you, God. Oh, it's not there. Then God speaks again. Listen. A heart that is tender is a heart that hears. I, was, I am one of seven kids in my family. Brother, I was talking about not calling the right name. I didn't even have a name until I was 15, I felt like. Mom and dad would, would hold of us. So they do certain things. Like, we'd be sitting in church all on one pew, right? And we were messing around. My, my dad would snap and point. Now, listen, don't do this. Don't do this. If your dad does that in church, right, what does he want you to do? Help me here. What? Yeah, what you, well, try this sometime. Snap back. Hey, look, Dad, I can snap too. Now, don't do that. It's not going to work out well. Hey, Dad, I can use both hands. Yeah, you do that, Dad. Yeah, he'll use both hands too, but <laughs> not in a good way. Oh, yikes. But my dad, to, to, to get us to calm, would whistle. Like that. Can you try that with me? Can you do that whistle? Yeah, only, only about half of you can whistle. 
All right, that's good. No more whistles, all right? Now you're driving me nuts. No. <laughs> He'd whistle. Well, it was about, it was about oh, two or three years ago now, maybe a, little, maybe a little more, four or five years ago, but I'm an adult. I'm here at First Baptist Church. I have my own job, my own vehicle, my own house, and I'm married, and I'm at Walmart, because that's where married people shop is Walmart. If you can't find it at Walmart, you don't need to have it. Own it in life, okay? It's the best place. Uh, and all of a sudden, I hear a whistle like that. I'm with my wife, and I, you know, I said, honey, I said, that's my dad. She said, oh, whatever. Guess what? Two aisles over was my dad. <laughs> whistling for my little brother. I had heard that whistle enough. I was in tune with that whistle that when I heard it again, I about wet my pants. <laughs> Are you that close to hearing from God? Can he just whistle? Or whisper, and you hear it? Or does he have to hit you upside the head with a two by four? A tender heart is a heart that hears. Would you look at me in that verse, though? There's another aspect, a characteristic of this heart that's tender. In verse 27, thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before thy God when thou heardest his words. The second characteristic of a tender heart is a heart that is humble. A humble heart says, God, not my way, but your way. God, you're smarter than I am. That means if you tell me something, I'm going to listen. I'm going to see that your way is, is better. Learn to help my kids learn how to walk. Kids often want to do things all by themselves. You know, this is part of the problem of being a Christian because it's opposite of everything that we see. I've got a little niece. Her name is Audrey Grace. She's beautiful. All right, and she's just learned to walk. And this is the way life's supposed to happen. When a child is born, everything is done for them. They're fed, they're changed, they're carried everywhere, but eventually they learn to walk and eat on their own and use the restroom by themselves, right? This is a good thing, so that by the time you're in high school, you ate lunch and, and you could do these things, right? All right, you were able to walk over there, hopefully ladies without tripping, you're a little bit okay, and, and uh, and if someone can't do these things when they're 15, all right, then we say, oh, we, there needs some help right here in this situation. But a Christian life, when we start off as a Christian, before we're saved, we're very independent. We say, I can do it myself. I can get done by myself. Once we trust Christ, we're supposed to come dependent on God. That's humility. It's God, you have to help me. I can't do it. God, I can't figure it out. God, your way is better than my way. Remember the Titanic. They had pride, and it sunk. And every time that you have pride in your life, you will sink because God resists the proud. He sinks it, but he gives grace to the humble. You can't grow as a Christian if you're not reading your Bible, spending time with God and praying, and if you're saying no to God. Remember a time in my life that I was saying no to God. You ever say no to God? I have. And I knew what God was asking of me. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to. You say, why, Pastor Al? Because I'm selfish, stubborn, and not always humble. That's why. Same reason as all of us. I didn't want to. I had someone say that to me. Listen, you can't grow if you're not spending time with God, reading your Bible, and praying, and saying no to God. And I knew I was saying no to God. It was like a knife in my heart boom, from the Holy Spirit. But God helped me to make a decision to be humble that day. A tender heart is one that hears. It's one that's humble. And lastly, it is one that heeds. You see, it's not enough just to hear the voice of God. It's not enough just to acknowledge that it's better than your voice or his way is better than your way. That, that's, the easy, that's the easier part. All right, God, I hear you. Yep, God, you're smarter. And then too many people go off and do their own thing. There'll be some of you today, maybe even already this morning, some of you young men who struggle with an addiction to pornography and you've heard the voice of God you know that that's a problem you've been convicted about it you've been humble God help me but you never take the steps you never finally obey and, and get the help that you need you see a tender heart is one that that heeds that one that obeys even when it doesn't make sense I often say this our problem is not normally a is not normally a knowing problem it's a doing problem we normally know what's right, we just don't always do what's right. You see, a tender heart is one that obeys. 
If my kids obey, then they're listening to me, they're heeding me, and they're tender about that. And sometimes it doesn't make any sense. This past summer, I young people know that my wife and I were building a chicken coop. A chicken coop makes no sense in my life. I, I don't. My wife has 18 chickens. Two cats and half a dog. Three and a half pounds. Dust mop. Those of you who know my dog know this is true. We're building this chicken coop, and uh, we're putting up, my wife and I, a two by eight that's 16 feet long. This thick, 16 feet long. Somehow in the process, while I'm holding, my wife's holding one end, I move to the middle of it, it comes off and pops my wife in the head. Knocks her off the ladder. She were up about seven and a half, eight feet at this point. She had an Under Armour hat on, and uh, I think it was Under Armour, it was a pink, I think it was pink Under Armour. She takes her hat off, and there's just blood coming down like this. Just, I mean, she's like, call the ambulance, you know, and I'm like, honey, we can make it to the, to the emergency room. Johnny, my youngest, or my oldest son comes out, he sees mom and just, just blood. I mean, head wounds bleed profusely, all right? And there's just blood, I'm just telling everywhere. I grab a towel, and this towel fills up with blood. We jump in my truck, and I'm driving, down, I'm driving down Dixie Highway. I'm going about 70 miles an hour. My wife's not happy. She's like, you got to drive faster. You drive faster for ice cream. All right, she got hit in the head. So I step it up. We get down there to this emergency room. Lady's behind the desk. My wife says, like, hey, I need to see the doctor. And it's, it's, you know, I just laid him. Just wanted to be somewhere else in life. She's like, my wife's like, see? Takes off the towel and the hat and blood <laughs> down her face. He's like, oh, come back to the room. So we rush back to the room. We get back there and we get this thing cleaned up and, and we see there's a gash in my wife's head. It's pretty, pretty big. Lady comes in and uh, my wife's a tough lady. I love her. She's tough. She's German. She's a tough woman. She's sweet. She's beautiful, but she's tough. She uh, saw the, the device for staples and a needle for a shot. She goes, I don't want the shot. Just give me the staples. My wife was right there. She's sitting in this chair. I'm going to grab this chair and show you. She's sitting there like this. A lady comes behind her. All right, my wife's holding on to the side there, chair. She goes, kung, kung, kung. put the staple in. My wife, no shot, sits her. Give me another one. <laughs> kung, kung. Every time she wants something else, you're buying me food tonight. Kakong three. I want lobster. Kakong. I want crab legs. Kakong. My wife loves seafood. Five. Kakong six. Kakong. Kakong. Oh, I missed. The lady says back here. Seven staples in her head. No shot. She took it like a man. Oh, or better than a man. Say, do you buy her supper? Of course not. I'm not a wimp. My wife's tough. They didn't told her how to clean it up, and eventually it healed up. But God wants us to be tender to him. Not to show our own way. Not to do what we think we need to do, but to just listen, acknowledge, and obey. Sometimes we sit there in that chair. We know what God is saying. We know it's right. We're like, oh, I'm tough. I can endure this. And I have a tender heart? Respond. Be sensitive to God. When he speaks in that still small voice, he's going to speak, I believe, again when Brother Young speaks again. Respond to it. Have a heart that is tender towards God. You see, I know what a tender piece of meat looks like. It's pretty good. I know what a tender bruise looks like, and from the Bible, I know what a tender heart looks like. You have a tender heart today or not? Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have a tender heart toward you. So many distractions in this life, Lord. So many things that can sidetrack us. So many excuses we can make. But ultimately, Lord, we're responsible for our heart towards you. What about these young people? 
to be honest before you. He would say, Pastor Howell, would you pray for me? Pastor Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me, and, and I don't have a tender heart right now, but I want to have a tender heart. Maybe you have God-canceling headphones on right now, and you need to learn to listen to when God speaks to you. Maybe you've been resisting God right now, and you've been saying no, or you've not been humble. You've been saying, no, my way is better. One who would say, Brother Howell, would you pray for me? I'll raise my hand because God spoke to me while you spoke, and I want to have that tender heart, and I haven't. Would you pray that God would help me with that? Raise your slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll see it. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. Hands all over. Who else? Amen. Can I help you, young person? It starts right now. You don't have to wait till tonight or tomorrow at church. It starts right now. In just a moment, we're going to stand and have an invitation. At that time, I encourage you, if God touched you, to come ahead and come to the front and you kneel in an act of humility. And you pray and ask God to help you have the grace. See, without God's strength, I can't be humble. Lord, bless this invitation. May we respond the way you've prompted us, according to your spirit and your word. In Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand to our feet. If you need to come pray, you pray. You have a, hum- a tender heart today, a heart that pleases God. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say, yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. My answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Can you say that? You pray. Lord, we thank you for the ones who have indicated they've been touched by your word, your spirit today. Lord, I want to lift them up in prayer and pray that you would help strengthen them. Lord, may they have a heart that stays tender towards you, towards your word, and your way. Lord, I know that today we've had a lot of prayer and time, but into it, Lord, we need you in this last session, a few moments, as Brother Young speaks, that you would use him again. You accomplish everything that you wish today, Lord. We'll give you the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.